Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Derek, and I am the president of the Harvard Crimson. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you on behalf of the Crimson um, and what, to what should be an exciting conference. Speaking for both myself and others, we always look forward to the Georgia's conference each year. It's a terrific opportunity to hear and see from other college journalists, as well as the Neiman, um, the, what the fantastic folks at the Neiman have to say. Tonight, however, I have a great honor of introducing Lois Beckett. Um, she is currently a senior reporter at The Guardian in New York, covering gun politics, policy, and the rise of the far right. She previously reported for ProPublica, SF Weekly, and the Neiman Journalism Lab. She is a frequent contributor to TV and radio programs, including CNN Newsroom, NPR's On Point, and KQED's Forum. But perhaps most importantly, she is also a alum of the Harvard Crimson. <laughs> Since her days at our building on 14 Plimpton Street, however, she's done quite a lot. Her 2014 story, Black America's Invisible Crisis, detailing PTSD caused by gun violence, won a 2015 Deadline Award for Public Service and a NABJ Salute to Excellence Award in Investigative Journalism. Especially amidst our current national discourse on gun violence, there are few better people to address us as college journalists today. I know her talk will be fascinating and timely, so please join me in welcoming Lois Beckett. Thank you all so much. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I went to this conference about a decade ago. And I have a really strong memory of it, um, mostly of like trying to be presentable when I was totally sleep deprived from working on some series of articles or other. Um, but I have a very vivid memory of Josh Benton, who will be speaking to you tomorrow, talking to us about what we needed to do to actually make it as journalists uh, in 2008 or 2009, um, which might have been some of the worst years to become a journalist in this country in recent memory. Um, and I just remember this feeling of total, like not total panic, but just, oh, like all of my ideas about what kind of journalist I thought I could be were totally dashed by Josh. Um, but he actually had very useful ideas about what it would take actually to get a job and health insurance and be able to support myself as a journalist. Um, and I am especially grateful to Josh and to the Neiman Foundation because um, a little bit later on when I was a freelancer living in the Bay Area, I wrote for the Neiman Journalism Lab and this was like my main source of food and rent money for about a year when I was just starting out. Um, so this is a place that means a lot to me. Um, and I'm also really excited um, to be talking to all of you today as college journalists um, because, you know, this conference happens every year and it's always important to take a step back and to hear what you're thinking about, um, what issues you're facing, which, as we've been talking about, are so often the exact same issues that uh, professional newsrooms are facing. Um, these things go, we talk about the challenge of newsroom diversity, um, which is such a big part of what we all need to do, and it starts in college. Um, and so your success or failure in diversifying your newsrooms has a real impact on um, what the newsrooms that you will um, go into um, and in how accurate and um, how honest all of our journalism can be. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it's also a moment, especially after Parkland, um, when there's been a real reversal in thinking about what authority is or what power is. And it's not uh, adults sort of preaching to young people. It's not like me coming here and saying, like, let me tell you what I know as a journalist. Because we saw as a country that actually adults have failed to deal with the crisis of gun violence in this country, have failed over and over again. Um, and what we saw for the first time, and, and it's not just the hype. It's, I've been covering this for five years. This is real that students stood up and they changed the balance of power in the debate. And it was so interesting to see Emma Gonzalez, David Hogg standing up and seeing the NRA respond in ways that just had never done before, immediately on the defensive. The fact that Dana Lash showed up for that CNN town hall, the NRA usually doesn't play, right? Like Obama had a town hall, they just didn't send anybody because they didn't have to. So a lot of small things showing that this, that young people had really changed the terms of the debate. Um, I was in Parkland a little bit before the March for Our Lives and talking to this dad whose daughter had run out of Marjory Stoneman Douglas um, that day. And this is not like your sort of super liberal dad. He's a DEA agent. Um, so he had, works with guns a lot with his work. 
But he said, listen, I've given up on my generation and my parents' generation. You know, I, I don't think we're going to be able to fix anything. But these millennials who we've been maligning for a long time, like, I think they've really got it. And like, my daughters are 15 and 13. And when they come home and have, and have sleepovers with their friends, their friends are talking about changing the world um, and about social justice. And I'm just so amazed because he said, like, I was pretty shallow when I was that age. I was not talking about changing the world. So I think there is a lot of sense from adults, I would probably count myself among them, um, that we've messed everything up um, and that you will save us. So no pressure. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about, about that. And hopefully in, in the Q&A, we can have a real discussion because I'm really interested in um, I think all of the issues that I cover, from covering um, guns and gun politics to covering neo-Nazis, these are um, issues that are relevant on college campuses. Um, college campuses especially have been the front lines of this, both the sort of debate over free speech and also intertwined with the rise of neo-Nazis in America. Um, and college campuses and the kinds of activism there have been, and the college's commitment to free speech have been weaponized um, by neo-Nazis in an attempt um, to use that as a lever for power, which is actually something that neo-Nazis have been doing since the 50s. Um, George Lincoln Rockwell toured in his hate bus, who is the founder of the American Nazi Party. He did the exact same thing. He went to Brown, and he hoped he would get a lot of headlines by college students getting angry at him. Um, so none of this is particularly new. Um, so I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about guns. I'm going to talk about neo-Nazis. Um, I'm going to talk about newsroom diversity and how that ties the two of them together, and then open it up for questions. So. One of the things in covering guns for five years now, as I have, um, going back to just um, about April or May of 2013, um, right after the Mansion Toomey bill had failed after Sandy Hook, the big, Obama's big gun control push. And you know, I've seen again and again these same debates happen um, cyclically after each mass shooting. And it's really so frustrating. But one th what I want to talk about that's probably one of the most important things to me is that that debate and that resurgent debate doesn't look the same to everyone. And after Parkland, when Emma Gonzalez was first speaking out, there was a lot of excitement from many people that, oh, then this is going to change. Like, these kids have really got it. And there were also a lot of Americans who were sitting back and waiting because they had seen this debate play out over and over again. And the empathy and the rage and the sadness and they knew just how sad it was. And they knew, some of them quite intimately, what it means to lose a child, what it means to lose a child to gun violence in particular. How that doesn't go away, it doesn't change, it doesn't stop, that it continues with you. And the trauma of that kind of event ripples throughout families um, and ripples through communities um, in a way that can have profound and lasting effects. Um, but they also know that the empathy that America has always expressed after these incidents, um, which is portrayed as so vast and overwhelming is actually very narrow. And it doesn't go very far because um, there's so much gun violence in this country. The majority of gun violence in this country is not mass shootings, right? It, there are different estimates, but um, any mass shooting is sort of defined numerically as about 3% of the gun murder victims in this country every year. And so the narrative that has been portrayed and that journalists have written, there is this litany of that politicians and journalists say the same things, that we talk about Columbine, and we talk about Virginia Tech, and Aurora, and Sandy Hook, and now Parkland, as if those, that was what gun violence in America was. And everything else, the majority of the people who have been lost, the majority of the grief, and the sadness, and the loss to our country is just erased and glossed over. Um, there was a father I spoke to many years ago in Hartford who lost his son. Um, Hartford, just a couple miles away from Sandy Hook, who lost his son about two months before the Newtown shooting. And he just said, you know, he was a community activist and a minister, and he had worked his whole life on preventing gun violence and being present in the community. And then his son was uh, killed when he was only about 20. Um, and this, this pastor said to me, you know, when my son died, nothing happened, right? Like the world just went on. And when the kids were shot at school, the world stopped. And it was so right that the world stopped. The world should have stopped, but the world should have stopped for my son, too. And so there was this moment after Parkland where people were waiting to say, like, will this really be different? Like, will the conversation, will the kind of empathy that we have change? And I remember so distinctly, it was two and a half weeks after Emma Gonzalez first gave her big speech, that, um, that she t started tweeting about 
the Parkland kids sitting down with kids from Chicago. And it was just a sequence of four tweets, um, some pictures in it. And it just stated very simply, like, we sat down with kids in Chicago who have dealt with this for years and deal with it every day. And it is outrageous that they have never gotten the kind of attention that we, primarily white students at a very, very wealthy suburban school, have gotten. Um, that's wrong. It needs to change. And we can do something about it. We can share our platform, and we will share our platform. And I remember seeing that ripple out, and I heard about it later from, from activists and from parents that I know just saying, oh, maybe this time it will truly be different. Maybe this time it will actually change. And I remember going to the March for Our Lives in Washington, which of course we covered. Um, and you know, there's this way in which it's not that students in Chicago or St. Louis or you know, the racial disparities and gun violence have, have never been mentioned. But usually the racial disparities were not talked about as if saying that half of gun murder, murder victims, more than half, are black men and boys would not be something that would move us to action. It's sort of something that's been glossed over. But usually it would be you know, five mass shooting victims, most of them white, and then there would be a family of Chicago at the, at the end, and it would be like, oh, we're all in this together. This problem is united. This is a problem that affects everybody in America. And, and that's true in some ways, but it is not a problem that affects everyone in America equally. And to hold up 100 people and 5,000 people and say these two things are of equal weight and we must address them equally, that doesn't really make sense if you're thinking about it objectively or if you're thinking, like, how do I save the most lives, which I think is how most of us approach this. Most of us think we think about this debate. And especially if you say, you know, we're going to line up a stage full of the 100, and those 5,000 will you know, mostly not be spoken for. Or when they're spoken for, and this is one of the hardest things to hear, to hear parents having to stand up and detail their credentials of their son to be clear that their son was like a good kid, which suburban parents don't have to do. They don't have to, like, in these sort of implicit ways, explain that their kid was an honor student, that Idea Pendleton was an honor student, so that we should be upset that she was murdered. Like, that's ridiculous. And yet it's so much a part of our debate and has gone unremarked for so long. And, and so what happened at the March for Our Lives and what was exciting about it, was new about it, was the way in which the Parkland students said, it's not enough to have one person up. It's not enough to sort of say, yes, you know, sort of have a, a clause, as there was a clause in one of Obama's speeches, that like, you know, that this happens in Sandy Hook, and it happens in Newtown, and it happens every day on the streets of Chicago. We're going to just sort of walk by that one pretty quickly. But they interspersed activists from across the country. They had multiple activists from Chicago, um, from Washington, DC, um, a young woman from the suburbs in Virginia, from uh, an 11-year-old from Brooklyn. Um, and they said, they put it at the center. And so that was the first thing to say, like, this is, this is a center that has to be the center of our movement because it's the center of the challenge that faces us. It's the center of the grief and the loss that we're facing. And the second thing was that they were just willing to say outright, like, this debate has been racist. Like, this response has been racist. Like, we've got this wrong. We have done wrong. And as someone who's covered the gun control movement um, for, you know, five years, like, just saying that straight out was so revolutionary. Because it's not like everybody didn't know who was working in this movement that that was the case. And there were many, many people who were very well-meaning and wanted to do something about it. Um, but it was too hard for some of those older advocates just to say, like, we failed. And just to say, like, this is wrong. This whole thing, this whole debate that is very well-meaning and is full of grief um, is also wrong and it leaves people out. So to me, that was incredibly powerful. But it's also a pretty serious indictment of journalism, because this isn't just politicians or activists who have written about this issue in these ways. These are journalists who have meeting the desire and the need and the interest that people have in rare and horrible mass shootings have catered to that and have not done very much to push back against, um, against the framing and the understanding uh, of this issue. Um, and you know, have have in so many different ways um, not challenged what people believe about violence in this country and not challenged what it, kind of violence is fixable and what is not. And if you ask why that is, I mean, one of the obvious answers is that our newsrooms are not diverse. They're not diverse uh, in terms of race. They're not diverse economically. I think a problem that has probably become more severe as journalism has become a more unstable industry. Um, they're not 
diverse enough regionally or geographically. Um, again, uh, there are a lot of jobs, a lot of the younger journalists I know who might once have been working across the country at newspapers that are now struggling are now clustered in the coasts. Um, I think I feel very strongly um, that the g coverage of, of the gun debate has also been ideologically super biased towards people who are not part of gun culture, um, and that has been full of small and large inaccuracies about guns. Um, so there's all of these um, ways in which newsrooms um, have not lived up to our stated values. Um, and you know, the American Society of News Editors, I think in 1978, said, we need to achieve, achieve parity in our newsrooms to the communities we serve, which like, duh, everyone agrees that that's a good idea because it's practically a challenge to understand what's going on in the world and you need people who can understand all the different parts of it. Um, on, in theory, we're all on the same page with that. Um, but that they set the goal of 2000, and 2000, they were nowhere near close. Um, now the goal, I think, is 2025. Um, still, we're nowhere near close. Um, sort of about 17% of journalists in this survey are journalists of color, um, and that's in print newspapers and online. Um, and nearly 40% of Americans are <coughs> Americans of color. Um, so, and it's so hard because this is not because um, editors are racist, and it's not because editors don't know that diversity is important. But I spoke to Howard French, who's a former New York Times editor on this issue, and wrote a great article called The Enduring Whiteness of the American Media, um, which if you haven't read, you really should. It's, it's a phenomenal piece of journalism. And he said, like, it's, it's, what's hard is it, it's small things. It's always like that diversity is something that editors say they value and that they do value, but it's never the number one priority. And so there's all, almost always another reason when you're making hiring decisions and there's so many different things going on um, that, that it just doesn't happen and we haven't gotten there. And so, you know, as someone who covers gun violence, that was very clear to me. But it became even more clear to me when I was assigned um, after the 2016 election. Um, it was clear that the far right and neo-Nazis and white nationalists were suddenly considered by our competitors and by us as, as value, you know, valid for news coverage. Um, and I had been covering the gun debate, so I was pretty comfortable with people with guns. And I was white, so I was assigned to cover this beat. And I was willing and interested to do it. Um, and I think you know, we can talk more in the Q&A like, about the, what happened um, and what happened in the coverage of white nationalists. Um, there is this sort of dapper white nationalist, Richard Spencer. There was the newspaper who said, oh, there's a new think tank, cool, that's cool, and it's coming to Washington, and like they're racists. Um, there was the New York Times piece that got so much criticism for focusing on that Nazi's um, wedding registry and sort of trying to understand what was in his heart and like how someone who is well-spoken and normal and middle class could be a racist, not interrogating who that might surprise and who that would not find that newsworthy. Um, and I think like this coverage has been challenging in a lot of ways, and I hope you will ask me questions about it, because I think that's a debate that we've all faced. Um, but one thing that I found you know, really hard was listening to how much the neo-Nazis loved the coverage. Like That was one of the first things I did when I came to this beat. So I listened to a podcast um, between Richard Spencer and Andrew Anglin, who run, is a neo-Nazi troll who runs this Nazi website, um, and Mike Enoch, who is a anti-Semitic podcast host, who also his wife was Jewish. Um, was outed from that, it's always very colorful. And Nazis know it's colorful, and they know that you'll want to cover it because of that. Um, and they were just so astonished. They were like, how has the media coverage been so good? It's been so amazing. They think that Steve Bannon is a Nazi. I love that. Like, they have journalists totally were so eager to connect us to Trump. So when we said we were connected to Trump, like, it totally worked. We're so famous. You know, do you think that liberals really want us to rise up? Because why have they given us so much coverage? Like, they just, we sort of, like, you know, they handed us the microphone. And they're talking about how, like, Donald Trump, as a man, like, he's probably not going to deliver on his policies. He's a nothing burger. Like, but it doesn't matter. Like, as a meme, he was really helpful to them. He allowed them to rise. And I, I wrote an email to this, um, one of the neo-Nazis, to follow up. And I was like, you know, you said that, uh, can you explain a little bit more why the media coverage has been so favorable? And he, the first email I sent to him was like, we're full of like misogynistic slurs, but like I just decided to pretend that that was professional language and keep going. Um, and, and he said, you know, yeah, I, um, well, I think there must be a lot of Nazi sympathizers in the media. And I was like, hmm, mm, OK. I like, wrote back, like, yeah, please tell me more. Why do you think there's so many Nazi sympathizers in the media? And this guy, Andrew Anglin, um, 
you know, is, is, well, I could say he's smarter than Richard Spencer. I will give him that. Um, and he wrote me back and he said, well, there's either two explanations. The coverage has been so good that either the media is full of secret Nazi sympathizers who want us to rise, or it's just breathtaking incompetence because why else would they have amplified us so much? Um, which I thought was a trolley thing to say, but interesting enough to share. Um, and I think I've wrestled with this a lot because I, you know, I've, I went back before my time. So I sort of started writing about them in January of last year. And I said, you know, what was the moment in which we as news organizations decided that like neo-Nazis were worthy of serious political coverage? Like, how did that happen? Who, like, who made that call and, and when? Like, who could we blame? Um, and I went back and one of the first times that Richard Spencer pops up as a source is in a really good story in August 2015, shortly after Donald Trump has made his incredibly racist um, campaign announcement, racist and xenophobic campaign announcement. And Evan Osnos sort of writes about the sort of blatant racism and xenophobia. But this is the challenge of writing about racism in America that, that newsrooms um, have faced, is that nobody calls themselves a racist, right? Like, nobody does. And no one's a racist in America. Um, and you know, newsrooms have not been very good at sort of, and because we associate racism with hatred or with being sort of, sort of morally bad, newsrooms have been reluctant to sort of put that label on people because it's seen as sort of this squishy moral thing rather than as something that you could define as sort of strictly as a category and say like, oh, these, these things have been met. OK, like it's fair to call this person a racist. And so what, hap what happens when like someone's calling Donald Trump a racist? Donald Trump says, I'm the least racist person you know. Who do you as a journalist go to if you don't have the authority in yourself to say, I can tell readers who's a racist or not? I'm comfortable doing it bad. That's not too hard. Well, you can call a professional racist and say, hey, there's a debate over whether this guy's a racist. What do you think? So that's how Richard Spencer sort of first steps into the news, um, is as this professional racist who can weigh in. And fair enough, that, that seems a reasonable thing. Journalists do that all the time. And you see a little bit more of stuff like that. Richard Spencer pops up again, a very much a focus on his, his preppy clothes and um, how sort of suave he is, um, how good looking he is. Um, and but I went back, and, and it's, it's not really a journalist who makes a call that makes Richard Spencer a legitimate news subject. Um, but it's Hillary Clinton who gives that speech about the alt-right in the campaign, attempting to, to portray how racist and extreme Donald Trump is by talking about the alt-right, using the phrase alt-right, talking about it. And of course, what that does is then every journalist is like, what's the alt-right? And then uh, Richard Spencer is credited with coining the alt-right. And so suddenly, everyone is calling up Richard Spencer. And there's an explosion of news coverage. And it's in the mouth of a candidate for the president of the United States. And so by journalist rules, OK, this is something that we can cover. And then, well, man, like, it's really interesting and, like, and crazy. And like, there are white nationalists and neo-Nazis, like, inherently interesting. And then the coverage you know, snowballs and snowballs. And I, I spoke to the author of the Mother Jones profile, the sort of dapper white nationalist profile. And he said, like, listen, I think that actually was a very fair profile. Um, and, you know, and a lot of the coverage that followed it followed up on it. But also, I think like, one profile is not the problem. It's the fact that everybody else did profiles, too, after it. And so there's a challenge here in sort of thinking about this, because at every individual step along this way, you can be like, well, I sort of see how that happened. Or like, yeah, it, it was newsworthy. Or like, and we were all making these decisions all at the same time, right? It wasn't there was no one bad guy in the newsrooms who, who made this terrible decision. We all decided, sort of looking at each other, that, that this was valuable to cover. Um, but it's also, a, you know, the debate and the, and the articles that got the most criticism were very much articles um, that were framed in ways that, like, focused on how interesting or weird or bizarre um, or sort of uh, ridiculous um, these neo-Nazis were, and that often didn't focus enough on the violence and the danger that they posed. Um, that sort of strangely, unlike most political coverage, allowed these people to speak for themselves um, as if they were reliable narrators. Um, my friend Anna Merlin, who's a great far-right reporter for Splinter, um, formerly the, the, one of the Gawker groups, um, said that these guys are unreliable narrators. Like, it's insane to trust them. And it's also dangerous um, to frame them as people to whom we should listen. And I think that's the other thing that has been really 
challenging but useful about covering this beat is talking to academics at Data and Society Institute, which is um, a great sort of think tank that works a lot with the tech world. And, and, and they challenged uh, journalists, including me, and they said, like, we like to think of um, sunlight as a disinfectant. Um, but that's not really how it works when you're talking about conspiracy theorists um, and Nazis, that journalism is also amplifying ideas. And even if you're negative, even if you're critical, you're still amplifying ideas and images. Um, and this is very much the case uh, that, that neo-Nazi leaders said, is they said, we don't care how critical your article is. I'm going to talk to you um, because I know that I will be able to recruit people with this article, no matter how negative it is. Because being in the paper is important, it's legitimizing. Um, so the question that I have asked, and, and we can talk about more, is, is how much does the diversity of newsrooms relate to um, the kinds of coverage of white supremacy that we sell and the mistakes? And I think it's really important for us all to wrestle with this because a lot of times this question is about diversity are super abstract. And it's like, oh, diversity is a good thing that we should do. But we don't talk about like, oh, diversity is something that is essential because if we don't have it, we will make really dangerous mistakes. We will cover gun violence for decades in a way that doesn't really line up with what gun violence in America looks like. There will be a rise of neo-Nazis in America that was amplified in part by a media that was maybe not as hesitant or maybe not as afraid of these groups as they could have been because of who was in the newsrooms, because of it was easier to see these guys as comical um, or absurd than it was to see their danger because of who you are, because of the people who are making the calls and covering them, um, who was sitting in those newsrooms. I think the last thought before I open it up to questions is, you know, to me, covering gun violence and, and covering white supremacists has been really connected. Um, because the hardest thing about covering you know, Nazis, and there's lots of stuff that's hard about it, but the hardest thing is, you know, knowing that there are lots of racist ideas in America, and people act in race, and racist choices and racist policies. Um, but I still, I think, thought before I covered um, outright neo-Nazis um, that they were worse. And what I found in talking to neo-Nazis and white nationalists like Richard Spencer and others was that when it came to talking about race and crime and race and violence, that the things that came out of Nazis' mouths were just not that different from things that many Americans still believe, like even liberal Americans. And maybe they were watered down or softened, um, but there still is a very widespread idea um, that there's something wrong with certain people, and that is why they are violent. Um, that is just such an ugly lie, and yet it, it, the whole gun debate sort of dances around it, and we don't make progress because we aren't willing to wrestle or to confront um, to call a lie, a white supremacist lie, a lie, and that's what it is. Um, and I think for me as a journalist, sort of thinking through this, one of the things that I found really challenging and one of the goals that I have in the work that's coming next is just to try more to be accurate about what the patterns of violence in our country look like. And, you know, to say, I think even in the response to Parkland, I think there have been some allies who have sort of stepped up and said, oh, like, yes, we want to help you. Like, we want to solve this problem. Maybe it's your problem, but we're here for you. And talking about gun violence, um, sort of urban gun violence that way. And from covering this beat for someone, like, that's just the wrong way to think about it. The people who are making decisions about funding for public health or funding for mental health, the people who are voting for police chiefs and prosecutors, who are making uh, federal policy decisions, who are voting for presidents, who are supporting attorney generals, like, these are white Americans. And to think about the violence that we see in our country um, as something that is happens in an environment set by the votes of the majority of us. That this is not a problem of some minority of people in certain places, but choices that we all make that affect each other. Um, so just flipping that um, and trying to cover that a different way, which is hard because it counteracts a lot of things that people believe that they don't even realize that they believe. Um, I think I've probably gone a bit over, but I will open up for questions from here.